Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan, your host. And as you can see, for those of you who are experts in Indian geopolitics, South Asian geopolitics, I have with me Michael Kugelman. Uh, most of you have either read his articles or watched him on TV or on some other show. So we at Conversations are lucky to have Michael today. And Michael, welcome to Conversations. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Yes, we are going to talk about Michael's latest article in, in the Time magazine talking about Modi 3.0. Uh, but before we go there, for those of you who have come to Conversations for the first time, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, press the bell icon, and don't forget to share it with others after you have watched it. So Michael, I found your article very, very interesting and uh, very optimistic. And uh, I want to specifically look at the first paragraph itself in which you imply that India is on the verge of transitioning from a middle power to a major power. Uh, and this would happen in Modi's 3.0. So I want to understand what you see as Modi's role in India becoming a major power, because would you have said the same thing if someone else had become the prime minister? Right. So first of all, thank you for uh, thank you for reading the article. Uh, it's always good to know that uh, good people like yourself are reading it. Um, yeah, I, I I agree that it is uh, perhaps a bit uh, optimistic, and I think that these debates about uh, India's role in the world and what type of power, if any type of power it is, you know, these have been fairly fraught debates. So one could argue that there is a level of controversy. Uh, you know, I would argue that um, it's a pretty fair argument to be made that India is a middle power. Some have argued that um, uh, it could constitute um, a major power uh, through a major economic power, and one could make an argument for that. But indeed, it is a bit ambitious to suggest that with Modi now back in power, that India is poised to transition from a middle power to, to a more major power, for sure. But um, you know, the, the main argument I make, and uh, when I don't make the argument, I, I hope that I've implied it, is that uh, Modi, uh, over his his decade as as prime minister, has uh, taken India in a very um, encouraging direction in terms of uh, how it how he's taken it uh, on the world stage, and I would argue that he has strengthened India's global role um, more so than any other leader has before him. And you know, I, you could look at. For example, how he's taken India's relationship with the U.S. I think that even though he's been he's op, India is still operating outside of the alliance system, India under under Modi I think has grown closer to the U.S. than in any other time, and uh, no other Indian leader has been able to to do that. If you look at India's um, influence and engagements in the Middle East, for example, I don't think we've ever seen another Indian leader that's been willing to. Uh, take India in the direction that Modi has in terms of taking relations with Israel to to a whole other level, uh, whereas at the same time strengthening ties with countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt uh, and so on. Uh, Modi has also been able to bring India into a number of new, uh, not new, a number of uh, prestigious regional global forums, including uh, you know something like the uh, uh, the missile technology control regime. You know these are not groups that anyone can get into. So um, yeah, and and my sense is that he has he has conducted or he has sought to conduct India's foreign policy um, with a degree of confidence. Some might argue arrogance. Um, but I think that um, in the eyes of many Indians, he has made India a more confident player uh, over overseas. Now, certainly one could push back against all this. And I would, in closing, I would say that I'm not suggesting that India will become a major power over the next five years. But I do think that because of Modi's track record, I think India has been a middle power for a fair amount of time. It's poised to now begin the shift of escalating to something bigger. Uh, than a middle power. But of course, time will tell what actually happens. Well, given the fact that it's one of the few uh, uh, nuclear powers that alone will make the case that it is a major power, isn't it? Well, there are only, what, nine countries which have nuclear power uh, and uh, one undeclared and one illegal in some sense with North Korea. But the fact that the United, uh, the world accepts India's nuclear weapons itself makes India a major power. But uh, I'm curious to see as to how there is a lot of talk about how, given the fact that Prime Minister Modi has now not even got a majority in the parliament, and so he has become significantly weakened at home, uh, that one particular aspect, uh, do you think that is going to have any impact on foreign policy? Uh, and not just the foreign policy in terms of its substance, in terms of its goals and its direction, but also on the style 
uh, in the diplomatic style, you know, uh, like you just alluded that there's a lot of confidence or in many ways even arrogance. Do you ex anticipate that there will be a difference in at least, will there be a difference in goals and will there also be a difference in style as we go along now? Yeah, I, I really don't think so. I mean, we could talk and maybe we will talk about the impacts that uh, a coalition government could have on Modi's domestic policy and his domestic agenda. I think there, there will be very real impacts and and uh, from his perspective, deleterious impacts. But when it comes to the impact of a coalition government on his foreign policy, I don't think there's really going to be much of one. And I say that for several reasons. One is that um, when you look at uh, when you look at Modi's coalition partners, and particularly the two largest ones, the two most influential ones, the, the ones that have the two largest number of seats beyond the BJP, um, you know, these are two parties that are that are regional uh, parties. They've got, uh, you know, they mainly have their bastions in Andhra Pradesh and in Bihar. Um, these are parties that don't really have much of a foreign policy vision or a strong view on how foreign policy should be uh, should be conducted. Um, so in that sense, I think that the coalition partners will likely defer to Modi on his foreign policy and how he plans to uh, to conduct it. Um, I would also argue that um, at least initially Modi's foreign policy priorities, which will be very similar to his foreign policy priorities in his previous term, will be viewed as non-controversial, not terribly new, you know, when it comes to things like trying to counter China, uh, when it comes to strengthening ties with the global south continuing to build out India's role in the global stage. I don't think that coalition partners will have any issue with it, with any of that. And I would also argue, you know, as you know, so many of, of the, uh, of, of the key people from Modi's second term are back for the third term. When you look at the list of cabinet ministers, many of them are the same. And that includes those that relate to foreign policy, whether you're talking about Jai Shankar or coming back as external affairs minister or Rajnath Singh coming back as the defense minister. Uh, the, we now know that the NSA, uh, Ajit Doval, is back. So there's a lot of continuity there. And, uh, you know, clearly these people are not going to try to defy what Modi wants to do on foreign policy. They will dutifully carry out uh, that foreign policy. The only exception here, I think, would be on the, the more controversial dimensions of, in, of, of Modi's foreign policy. And again, we have yet to see how this will play out. But, you know, as we saw during the, the latter part of his second term, the issue of transnational repression became a bigger issue. Uh, you know, the fact that there's good, good reason to believe that India's government has been complicit in um, a number of extrajudicial killings in Pakistan and particularly controversially in Canada and in the United States. So there, that's where I think there might be a bit of pushback from the coalition partners. But on the broad, the broad, big foreign policy priorities, I don't think you're going to see much pushback from Modi. And I think that he'll be in a pretty good position to pursue his foreign policy just in the same way that he would if he were not ruling within a coalition government. You know, I teach uh, American foreign policy here, and one of the things that I emphasize is grand strategy. Not not many people do. And when I was looking at the Indian uh, culture, I spent a lot of time with think tanks in January in India, in various cities. And I, I had this very unusual realization that India is a country where it's a, it's a country which has a grand strategy, but did not have a clear foreign policy. So unlike other countries which have foreign policies, but not necessarily a grand strategy. So from the day India became independent, or even before that, uh, you know, uh, uh, India wanted to be a big player on the stage. And, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru's speech that we have a tryst with destiny, which we will fulfill. And one of the elements of that tryst was to be a major power and to be, you know, a global leader. So, so as far as that is concerned, I think every Indian... <laughs> It's one of the most, perhaps the only thing on which all Indians probably agree upon is that India should be a great power. So from the grand strategy perspective, I don't think there's going to be any opposition within the coalition partners. In fact, when Rahul Gandhi was here in Delhi, when he was asked bluntly how his foreign policy would be different towards China from Modi, he basically said that it would be the same, you know, whether it's on Russia as well as China. So I think... The coalition partners or even the the opposition are not going to give Modi any grief on foreign issues, but definitely more on domestic policy. But on the flip side of it, given the fact that he's seen as a much uh, weaker leader and given all the hoopla about, you know, 
this time we're going to score 400 and then not even getting a majority. Will it change the way in which the international leaders and other countries see Modi and deal with him? Will that mean, you mean, will they be looking at him as, okay, this, this is not a 30 foot guy. This guy is now 10 feet tall. You know, will there be a diminished Modi when others look at India? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I really don't think that his standing will change uh, within the international community. And, you know, we th- we had a very um, immediate data point to, to look to. So you, you had a very large number of foreign leaders that congratulated Modi um, after the election results started to come in. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about um, foreign leaders from, from South Asia and, and well beyond that. And what's striking is that you had some foreign leaders congratulating him even before the elections had, uh, before the election results had been finalized, which I think suggests sort of conveys this, the sense that um, India is an important country. Modi is back. It's important that we, we go out there and, uh, and congratulate him. But I think it also reflects global views on, on Modi himself. And if you look specifically in a South Asia context here, you know, as you know, Modi invited most of the SARC country leaders to his swearing in ceremony. He did, he did not invite Pakistan and he did not invite the Taliban in Afghanistan, but everyone else was invited. And they all pretty much showed up, including the Maldives president. And that has been arguably India's biggest diplomatic headache in South Asia, aside from aside from Pakistan uh, over the la- over the last year or so, because you have a president in the Maldives who has who campaigned on a on an explicitly anti-India plank to expel the Indian military presence. He's moved quickly to strengthen security ties with China. And yet there he was. He came to the swearing-in ceremony. He talked about how important the India, India relationship with the Maldives is. So I think that's that's an indication of where he stands. And then, you know, he of course is um, you know, the G7 summit is happening this week. Uh, Modi is there, Modi will be there. You know, welcomed with uh, with open arms. So I really don't think that his his diminished mandate and his diminished political space in India will impact the way that he's looked at abroad. But I will acknowledge that a lot of this is because of not necessarily how the world looks at Modi, but it's how the world looks at India as this very strategically significant state. And you know, the, the, the sense is that you, you need to engage with Modi, warts and all, even if there are concerns about him, and there certainly are concerns. But I think that he benefits from, from leading a country that is an, a very consequential global player. Yeah, I mean, my own assessment is that the world deals with Modi because they want India. Whereas a lot of people in India think that the world deals with India because they want to deal with Modi. Right. So, <laughs> so the, the, the difference is very different. I, I, I'm curious as to this, this issue with Maldives. I've done several shows on Maldives. And I have this uh, amused perspective that maybe everybody these days is pulling a Modi, for example, uh, India continues to move closer and closer to U.S., expects the U.S. to get closer to India, and then continues to have relations with Russia. So isn't Maldives trying to do the same thing, that it expects India to forgive its loans and continue to help it with all kinds of things from drinking water to medical health care, while also building stronger relations with China? So I think all of these countries which are it's a kind of a hedging strategy, but a bit more aggressive than the normal hedging strategy. Uh, the G7 summit is happening. Uh, do you think that it is time to make it G8 and include India? I think you can make a fair argument for that. I mean, just based on the simple stats, the fact that India, by a number of measures, is now the world's fifth largest economy. And I believe the IMF and several other entities have described it as the fastest growing major economy in the world. So I think by virtue of that alone, it deserves uh, a seat in this very prestigious club. But I think that many of these clubs and forums are very slow to, to change and reform and expand. But um, we'll see. I mean, it is interesting that right now, as it stands, the G7 members, the formal members, generally speaking, they see it eye to eye on, on a lot of issues. And if India were to join it, if it were to become a G8, then I think there could be some issues just because of India's you know, view of the world, its view on multipolarity, its view of Russia, and, and so on. So I think that there's a level of cohesion and efficiency and effectiveness of the G7 because you know these countries are, are largely on the same page, again, with some exceptions. And that could become a 
problematic if, if India were to join. But yeah, based on its economic performance, and if the G7 is meant to consist of the world's biggest economies, uh, or at least some of them, I think it, it, it's it's a good thing for to consider uh, Indian membership. And boy, if, some, if that were to happen, I'm not saying it would, that is something that you could imagine Modi would really exploit for political uh, purposes uh, back home, you know, to join another really prestigious club. It would be a big achievement that he would definitely politicize. I'll be very frank about that. Well, one of the lessons of this current elections is that Indian voters don't really care for that uh, because he didn't brag about G20. He he went after Muslims in his election campaign. And that shows that uh, he couldn't say, elect me, look, I brought G20 to India, one of the greatest. In fact, G20 India was supposed to be one of the most comprehensive G20. One of the aspects of G7 is that it is not just about world's biggest economy because China is not in it. Right. Uh, you, it's also about being liberal democratic things, right? So it's more of U.S. and every and rich buddies, basically. Yes. If you're a rich country, you agree with the U.S., <laughs> then you're in that group. So one of the things that I want to understand is that I can make a very strong case for why India and the United States should be great allies. But while I was speaking, I spoke at both right-wing and left-wing think tanks in India. I spoke with people who are very close to the national security establishment in India. And there is a lot of uh, distrust of the United States. And people keep talking about 1971 and other places uh, and saying that, yes. And so the, the attitude seems to be that as long as we continue to benefit from this relationship, we will continue to do it as long as we benefit from it. So if you remember Ashley Telly's article in, in the Foreign Affairs, you know, in which uh, he basically said that if China were to attack India, India expects the U.S. to defend it. But if China were to get in, if the U.S. were to get into a war with China directly, then don't expect India to join in, you know, so there's this asymmetry of expectations. So, so while the U.S. is courting China, India and bringing it closer, uh, now providing technology. Uh, in fact, in the 2022 defense budget, they had a whole item for India, you know, training Indian mid-level military people, etc. But there are also other sounds coming from India, like India's engagement with BRICS, uh, India's engagement with SCO, and the constant attempt by Indians to say that this is a multipolar world. I see the word multipolar world as basically a world without America's leadership. That is a code. When someone says it's a multipolar world, what they mean is we don't want the U.S. to be the global leader. And also talk of de-dollarization, if you notice, there's this whole celebration uh, uh, of, of this the growing decline of de-dollarization. So... To what extent are the American policy elite, uh, and you are constantly in touch with them? I mean, you're in Washington, you're the director of the Center for South Asia Studies at the Woodrow Wilson Center, you write for foreign policy, you read what is also not published in, <laughs> in foreign policy, right? Uh, so you, you, the views, are, I'm sure you're very familiar, is to what extent are the American elite so much in need of the US, India as a balancing uh, act against China that it is willing to accept and uh, overlook these moves, which are clearly designed to reduce America's leadership and hegemony in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I guess I could respond in, in, in several ways. I mean, I agree. First of all, you very nicely laid out uh, all of the reasons why this relationship does remain a relationship that's a work in progress to some degree. As much as, as rapidly as it's grown over the last decade or two, there's still a lot of work uh, to, to be done. Uh, so yeah, se several things. One is that um, I do think that the current administration, the Biden administration, it has a fair number of, of India boosters, those that genuinely admire India and like India and wanted to succeed and want there to be a really deep relationship with uh, with the United States. But with that, I think has also come a tendency to oversell uh, the relationship with, with India. So when the president, for example, President Biden, uh, him and I believe several others in the administration have described the relationship with India as one of the most consequential U.S. relationships in the 21st century. 
I don't know if that's true. I mean, given that it's not an alliance, India refuses to join in the alliance system. Hard to believe that it could be one of the most consequential relationships of the 21st century. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, in that sense, you know, when you think about the really consequential U.S. relationships, you think about the U.S. relationship with its, with its allies, with its NATO allies, with its East Asia Treaty allies, um, with Israel, though that relationship has is, is gotten a bit complicated lately. So I think that, that there, there is a tendency to, to oversell um, the relationship. But I would also argue that particularly given developments internally in India over the last few years, there have become uh, increasingly become concerns in Washington um, among the policymaking community about the relationship with India. And here, I come back to the issue of transnational repression. You know, I think that for quite some time, officials here looked with concern at levels of repression increasing uh, in, in India you know, as part of uh, this very aggressive pursuit of Hindu nationalism and Hindutva. But it wasn't seen as something that directly impacted U.S. interests. However, now that there are indications that uh, India has taken this repression and made it a transnational thing, with the you know with these alleged um, you know the extrajudicial India's role alleged Indian role in an extrajudicial killing in Canada and an attempted one in the United States, this is something that has given pause. I think not given pause, but it has shifted perceptions of some of those U.S. policymakers that engage with India on the sensitive aspects of the relationship, the intelligence sharing, that type of thing. Because you know, let's be very clear: if you're sharing intelligence with India. If you're engaging in tech transfers, if you're doing very sensitive stuff, knowing or assuming, thinking, believing that this country, India, has been complicit in transnational repression on U.S. soil, that's going to think that's going to change the way that you think about India just a bit. Now, I would argue that the strategic dimensions of the relationship are so powerful on multipartisan levels in Washington that I think that that concern and those shifts in perceptions that I mentioned are not going to ultimately impact the view that it is a strategic imperative to continue to pursue par uh, partnership with India, given shared concerns about China. But I'll say this, if US-China competition were ever to reduce in intensity, or if India-China competition were to reduce intensity down the road, I think that could have an impact uh, on on the relationship, and there's already been some some discussion about this. But my view is that it's going to be a while before that happens. I mean, U.S.-China competition is so intense, and if you look at India's the broader geopolitical state of play in South Asia, China is a direct threat to India on its border. And China is very present in South Asia. It's increasingly projecting power in the Western Indian Ocean region. That's not going to change anytime soon, and I think that that will continue to to amplify. India's concerns about China, and by extension, the importance from India's perspective of partnership with the U.S., and also the U.S. view that it's important to maintain that partnership with uh, with China, uh, with India. And indeed, what Ashley Tellis and, and wrote about in Foreign Affairs and what others have said about the limits to U.S.-India partnership, it's very true. But I think that most U.S. policymakers have accepted that, and they're looking for workarounds to try to figure out how to deepen security partnership with India uh, outside of military cooperation, outside of the alliance system. And there you could talk about things like trying to work with India on strengthening its capacities to become a global tech player, to drive um, production, tech production away from China into India. So there's a lot of focus and in, in, in being creative about how to deepen this relationship, even with that factor of India not being a part of the, uh, the alliance system. You know, um, you brought this up twice about India's role in trying to basically assassinate Khalistanis here. And what was to me interesting was that the extent to which the U.S. was spying on Indian operations. I mean, there is no way they could have the intelligence that they had uh, and all the information that they share with Canada if they were not spying on, on Indian, <laughs> on people from the raw and also trying to penetrate uh, raw in India. So, I mean, that's not what friendly democracies do, right? I mean, but we do it to everybody. If you remember during the Obama era, we, we had even hacked uh, Chancellor Merkel's <laughs> cell phone and uh, listening to European leaders. So the United States does have this asymmetric relationship with everybody saying that, well, we will do what we want to do, but you can't do the same thing, right? So with the with the with India being aggressive in India here, trying to 
basically undermine uh, the Khalistani movement. The Indian position is that the United States and Canada are allowing uh, dissidents uh, who are labeled as terrorists in India to thrive here under the guise of freedom of speech. And with the Israeli issue, we know that America really does not care about freedom of speech when it comes to its allies. I mean, we are trying to suffocate our own population here with bills like HR 6090, which will essentially make it illegal to criticize Israel in this country. So the India expects that if it's going to have this, the most significant relationship of this 20th century, uh, why can't uh, the United States not allow anti-India activities from its soil? Uh, that is a question that is that was being asked repeatedly, that if you are an ally, you know, Jay Shankar once says, what kind of an ally you are, you don't even recognize our map. So how do you see this asymmetry where the United States has its uh, priorities uh, and it will not extend the same? Indians see this as unequal relationship. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it was Henry Kissinger, among others, that uh, openly acknowledged that uh, allies spy on each other. And it may not happen as much as that might suggest. But, you know, you look at, uh, you know, the, the story of U.S.-Israel, Israel relations. Uh, there's, there's been some things going on, the Jonathan Pollard case and, uh, and so on. But the heart of the matter, you know, gets to this issue of what type of relationship the U.S. has with India. You know, you mentioned the extrajudicial killing uh, example in Canada. You know, the U.S. and Canada are allies. The U.S. and India are not allies. The U.S. and Canada are part of the Five Eyes um, yeah. uh, grouping. And, you know, those are basically intelligence allies. I mean, those are some of the U.S.'s closest allies, uh, bar none, right? I mean, you know, the U.K. and uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Can India is not a part of that. And it doesn't want to be a part of that, right? It's not like the U.S. is trying to prevent India from, from having that. For, for, the U.S. is not trying to prevent the U.S.-India relationship from having that type of status. It's India that's not interested in, in being a formal, um, a formal ally. So, you know, this, this issue is going to linger. And this comes back to some of the contingencies that you were citing before about whether, you know, India goes to China. India goes to war with China. The U.S. would not uh, would would not help India, though. Honestly, I, I don't think India would be expecting the U.S. to help it. Um, I think that you know it might expect and would likely. The, the position that I heard is that if India gets into a warlike situation, mm -hmm. it expects the U.S. to help it, but it will not bet on it. See, that's the kind of thing. Yeah. That is where the distrust of the U.S. comes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But no, that's what, Ashley oh, Tallis was saying was the other way around. What Ashley Tallis was saying in his article was that India expects the U.S. to defend it against China, but also wants to make it clear that it's not going to fight for the U.S. or Taiwan against China. I mean, that's that's the point that Tallis was trying to make. Right. Yeah, it's 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 a fair point. But again, I think that U.S. officials have accepted the limits of this of this relationship and. Yeah, India would not be expecting the U.S. to put boots on the ground if it were fighting a war against China. It would look for intelligence support. Now, if you were to have a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, in, in, India likely would not be uh, would not be involved. I mean, is that problematic for U.S. policymakers? Maybe, but then again, at the end of the day, India is not really a big player strategically speaking in, in Southeast Asia. In the South China Sea. Now, I mean, that's started to change a bit of late. I mean, uh, one of the more prominent examples is India having shipped BrahMos missiles to the Philippines, which Manila will use to strengthen their capacity to deter China in the South China Sea. So that's where India is doing something that certainly serves U.S. interests. But you know, India is not much of a player uh, there, and. You know, because of India's, you know, you get back to this notion of India's strategy. It's had this constant, this continuous strategy rooted in this singular principle of strategic autonomy. Uh, it's not going to jump in and, and, and go help another country fight its war. It just doesn't do things like that. And I think that the U.S. has accepted this. But I, I do agree. You made a very important point about this notion of trust. To have a deep, allied relationship there has to be more trust than there is in the U.S.-India relationship. For all we talk about how this relationship is strengthened, you know, when you look at polls and public opinion surveys in India, you know, you do see the U.S. listed 
as a country that is not trusted or the country where there's a significant, significant amount of trust. And Russia, you know, countries like Russia will always rank higher uh, on these lists for India, who their most trusted partners are. And this sort of, I think, comes into view, comes into sharp relief at certain times. And, you know, I remember, I'm sure you remember a few years ago when India experienced that particularly horrific uh, COVID wave, one of the worst in the world. Russia was one of the first countries to issue messages of solidarity and to commit to sending aid to uh, to India. And the U.S. was quiet for a bit. And really, the main reason why it was quiet is that the Biden administration had just recently taken office. Bureaucratically, it wasn't ready to, to jump in. But I think for many in India, it was another sign of, well, when India really needs someone to, when it really needs a friend, when it needs a friend to jump in and be there in a pinch, it's going to be Russia. It's not going to be the U.S. I think that that really sharpened perceptions among some, certainly the left wing and the right wing, as, as you describe it, those that I think have the strongest feelings uh, about the U.S., strongest critical feelings. That's when those perceptions will be sharpened. But yeah, I think that on on policy levels, you know, and within the strategic elite, the political elite in New Delhi, there's a lot of goodwill vis-a-vis the U.S. I think the the problem is that there is a lot of media in the US, which is critical of India. So so if you look, read the Washington Post and New York Times during the election campaign, there was a lot of criticism of Modi as well as India uh, and so on, which you will not get from Russia or China or, or, or Saudi Arabia, right? So so the fact that there are there are forces in the United States which worry about human rights and and democracy, etc., which in India are seen as hypocritical because they will point to the U.S. doing the similar things, uh, and, and and when India does those things, uh, it is criticized. Uh, I want to talk about this cricket match, which happened in New York between India and the United States. And one of the most remarkable aspects of it was, look, these days, no matter where India is playing, for Indian cricketers, it's like playing at home. So even in Australia, there are more Indians in the stadium than there are Australians watching the match. Uh, and it's the same in England, wherever India goes to play, largely because India has such a huge diaspora, and now India has a rich middle class, so people actually travel to play. And so what happens is it's very depressing for the op- opposing teams to play. Yeah. <laughs> What was happening in New York was when the U.S. was playing India, the audience was cheering for both the teams. This is something very unusual. It's not often that Indians these days cheer for the opposing team. Uh, in Ahmedabad, in the World Cup final, there was silence when Australia won. There was no cheering or anything at all. So, so there is this other side to India-U.S. relations, which is this powerful, influential uh, increasingly growing, wealthy, outspoken uh, diaspora. Uh, how do you see it's playing? Like, for example, I mean, there are lots of Indian Americans now working, and it's quite possible that very soon we will have an Indian American as president of the United States. Uh, so, how do you see the role of the of the Indian diaspora in U.S. India relations? Yeah, great question. And by the way, I'm delighted that you brought up cricket. I, I'm a big fan, even though I'm still very clueless after many years of trying to learn the, the sport. And you, know, you talk about the Indians uh, watching the, these matches. The, as you know, there are Indians that were playing on Team USA, or India Origin um, uh, players. So it's, it's, to your question, the diaspora is critical. Um, and I think this is something that Modi has really leveraged in his foreign policy. I mean, the Indian diaspora in the U.S. is, uh, you know, it's one of the bigger ones. It's, it's, it's definitely the biggest South Asian Asian diaspora. It's one of the fastest growing uh, Asian diasporas uh, on the whole, and has been for quite some time. And uh, obviously, this is this is this is significant for U.S. domestic politics. But as I said, this is something that Modi has really leveraged uh, in in foreign policy. He sought to make these these connects to the Indian diaspora in the U.S. and elsewhere to help strengthen India's engagement with with the world. And as you may know, it so happens that. A significant portion of the Indian diaspora in the U.S. are uh, Gujaratis. They're originally from Gujarat, and so I think that that helps Modi as well. I mean, he, of course, himself is is a Gujarati, so there's that there's that connect there. Um, so yeah, this is this is significant, and we talk about soft power and cultural diplomacy. You know, if you want to look at um, one of you know one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why India has become an increasingly 
consequential global player and why, then one of the many reasons why India's relationship with the U.S. is strengthened, you have to look at the diaspora through its its activities. As you had noted, it's a quite quite a prosperous, successful, wealthy diaspora. It's an increase, increasingly prominent one uh, in politics, for sure. Not as much high up. You know, we've never had a U.S. Uh, Indian American president, but you know, we do have a number of Indian American members of Congress. And on state and local politics, you've got significant numbers of of Indian Americans. That has an impact. Uh, and certainly, you know, Indian culture, Bollywood has become an increasingly big deal, or not a big deal, but it's become increasingly something that a lot of Americans pay more attention to now than they did uh, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and I think the diaspora plays a role in helping advance that uh, as well. So, yeah, I think this is a really big part of the relationship. And it's, it's a cliche because you hear it so much, but it's true that the Indian American diaspora it can serve as a bridge to uh, the the U.S. India relationship, but I but I would say this that we have to be careful. Uh, we need to be nuanced in looking at this because many have argued that you know you've got an Indian diaspora that's very keen in uh, promoting U.S. India relations and all of that. There's been talk about all the support that the India that the 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 Indian diaspora here has for Modi, but I think things are changing uh, as we look at uh, the newer generations of Indian Americans, particularly those that are born in the U.S. Uh, and so on. You know, the, speaking anecdotally, and, and there has been some some survey research to bear this out as well. You know, you are seeing more Indian Americans, particularly those on the younger side, that are expressing concerns about Modi's India and about what Modi stands for. Some of the more you know the Hindu nationalism issue, and also seeing more that are not as interested in playing a role in advancing the relationship, doing advocacy, that type of thing. So it's such a large diaspora, it's sort of an obvious thing to say, but you know, we need to be careful not to, uh, to overgeneralize it. I mean, Indian Americans, students are also playing a big role in this, uh, the current Middle East related protests yeah. we've seen on Ivy Leagues. In fact, uh, I mean, some of the chants and songs that were sung were in Hindi, uh, mm -hmm. straight from, and these are not just, uh, Indians grew up here, but people who have come here to study. This is my last question. I mean, one of the uh, your article was quite comprehensive. It talked about foreign policy challenges and achievements. You talked extensively also about the economic challenges that India faces, especially youth unemployment. Uh, I maybe we'll talk about that a little later. But uh, one of the things that is often highlighted especially during the CAA protests that happened in 2019 and 20, and then subsequently during these elections, is this awareness of the rise of Hindutva and Hindu ideology and Modi as the leader of Hindu nationalism. Do countries, when they look at India and are looking to build alliances with India, how do they perceive the Hindu side of it, of Modi? Uh, and this is not just about celebrating Ram. One of the most important elements of Hindu nationalism is suppressing minorities, uh, especially erasing their past uh, and marginalizing them, trying to reduce them as a political force. Modi, for the first time in India's history, we have a government in which there is no Muslim minister in the cabinet. Are these things troubling for Western democracies or they're okay with it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that it's there's there's two different issues here. The the first one is how governments in the West and beyond view this side of Modi, and the other issue is how they actually respond and, and react to it and incorporate it into policy. And I would argue that uh, there's there's a lot of concern um, throughout uh, much of of the West, and also uh, in some countries in in the Middle East, given it's the Indian Muslim community that's been particularly impacted by this. But then, if you look at how these these countries and regions have reacted, not much there, right? Not much there. Um, and I think this is particularly concerning. Uh, not concerning. Well, one one might argue concerning. Particularly significant in the context of the Middle East and the broader Muslim world, given that Indian Muslims have faced so much, so many challenges. Um, because of this aggressive pursuit of Hindu nationalism, um, you do not see Muslim uh, world capitals saying much at all publicly about any of this. I mean, there was one exception, you know, when you had several senior BJP leaders that said things that were, that insulted the Prophet <laughs> Muhammad, at that point, you'd had a few, you know, you'd had some few governments reacting. Now, public sentiment, which is very different, 
um, you know, th that, that really erupted. And even if you look at the Muslim majority countries in India's neighborhood, Bangladesh, the Maldives, certainly Pakistan, um, you've seen a lot of rising anti-India sentiment um, because of Modi's Hindu nationalism policies. And this is going to be a big challenge for Modi as he tries to strengthen relations with his neighbors, not Pakistan, which he's not interested in doing, but with other countries. Um, so there's that. But in terms of elite views and you know the views of governments, uh, you know they really are not... I, they're, they're not in a position, they, they've, they've calculated that it's not worth taking these concerns and incorporating that into policy in terms of advancing these concerns with Indian interlocutors. And obviously the main reason for that is how they view India on the whole as a, as a strategically significant state, as a commercially significant state. You know, so many of the, you know, the Gulf states and, you know, the, uh, the Saudis and, and the Emiratis and so many other uh, countries in the Middle East and the Gulf they view India as an important investment uh, destination, investment partner, and they don't want to they don't want to um, jeopardize that type of uh, that type of relationship. You look at a country like Indonesia. Indonesia is a country that has been of increasing interest to India for energy imports, particularly coal imports. That's important for Indonesia. So, uh, what I'm saying is that um, you got a lot of governments in many parts of the world that are very concerned about what they're seeing with this Hindutva thing. But it's not something that they're going to put it in a position where they're going to make it uh, a part of the policy. I mean, the exception, as we already discussed, as I discussed, is the issue of transnational repression, because that's something that has directly impacted the interests of, of several countries, Canada and the U.S. So they can't obviously they can't just let that go. But when it comes to everything that's playing out in terms of Hindu nationalism within India's borders, it's not something that you've seen a lot of. Uh, response from uh public response from from countries and it's, it's not something that they're going to take up in a big way bottom line i mean uh this is I mean, this is something that's been happening for quite some time and i don't necessarily see that changing particularly and because i suspect that if there is one impact that a coalition government will have on modi's policy it will be the hindutva uh, issue just because the two largest uh, coalition partners are ideologically dissimilar from the BJP. They're secular in outlook. They've sparred with Modi on some of these issues in the past. And I think with their combined 28 seats that they have, if they got really upset with something Modi was doing on the Hindu nationalism front, they could threaten to quit the government. If they do that, the government collapses. And that's not something that Modi could risk having. One of the partners uh, from Andhra Pradesh, uh, he called Modi a terrorist a few years ago. So, well, that's interesting. We shall see how it goes. It is also because most of the Hindutva aspect of it is uh, internationally more like yoga and uh, lip service rather than anything aggressive. Most of it is aggression is internally directed. And countries like the Middle East have sent a message to India saying, uh, you can kill all Muslims, but don't say anything negative about the Prophet. <laughs> Peace be upon him. And I think the Modi government has learned the lesson that. Uh, so. So th this has been a very interesting discussion, uh, Michael. Thank you for joining conversations. Uh, and uh, I think we will continue our conversations. Uh, my audience, uh, conversation viewers will definitely uh, find your thoughts quite interesting. Uh, and we will continue the conversation because I do think that in this term, uh, India will become more closer to the U.S. increasingly as Russia goes through uh, you know, you can see the level of escalation against Russia that is happening, including at G7. And one of the agendas is, you know, using Russian money to help Ukraine. And uh, so you will find India uh, becoming more and more closer to, to the U.S. Uh, unless it wants to fight with the West for Russia, which I don't think India is interested in doing. So thank you very much for joining Conversations. Well, thank you. Yeah, this was indeed a great conversation. Uh, thanks for having me and hope to join you again another time.